So let's get started, I guess. Um, I feel like I should give a little bit of like a background into how I got into a Marie Kondo themed presentation. Basically, I don't know if you all remember, Marie Kondo obviously has an amazing show, um, Tidying Up with Marie Kondo on Netflix. If you haven't seen it, get into it. It's great. Um, and basically, it came out not this year, but last year on New Year's Day. And I was feeling like quite sorry for myself, a little bit hungover, shall we say, on New Year's Day. And I binge, started binge watching like, Marie Kondo in bed by myself with my Nando's and just like cried nonstop um, while she was like helping people declutter their lives. I uh, just cried a lot. And um, I basically bought the book. Her, she's got like a book that goes with it, which is called The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying. And uh, I was doing like a lot of business travel at the time as well. So it gave me loads of time to really get into the book and just really like, you know, embrace what she was trying to say. And uh, so I started reading the book. And then as I was going through it, I was thinking about how we could apply some of these lessons that she gives in the book, which is obviously about tidying your own home, um, how we can start applying them to like how we communicate with, with other people. Uh, and specifically in this instance, I first gave this talk last year in January um to uh, internal staff at crowd so throughout this deck there's going to be mentions of like clients and stuff like that but really this is applicable for anyone who get, wants to get like information across in whatever format so whether you want to you know, talk to your own clients or whether you want to talk to internal you know stakeholders or you know if you're doing a presentation for your mom and dad your next zoom quiz whatever all of these things are applicable you can take on all of these lessons um but yeah so basically what i've done is i've pulled out some of her quotes and then we're going to talk about how they can like be applied to um presentations so um let's get started Ooh, let's get started if it moves to us. lovely okay so the first uh, thing she says is you can't tie you have never learned how and i think this is really applicable to like quite a lot of us but so in the book she basically talks about how we're all just expected to know how to tidy like suddenly we just you know it's like innate knowledge that we get from birth but of course it's not it's not it's ridiculous we'd never learn so you need to learn really how to tidy and the same is true of decks like a lot of us are just thrust into this sort of workforce um and we just said you know we're told by our bosses like here go away and make a deck and like a lot of us you know will find that quite challenging and like how do you display the information that you want to get across in like a visual medium in a way that's still going to be like digestible so i don't want anyone to feel bad like if there's the when i first did this i used some examples of, of internal slides that we've used at crowd which is a little bit savage of me but i don't want anyone to feel like they're doing anything wrong just take this lesson on board and just think you know, I'm, this is my learning and, you know, this is about how I'm going to start tidying up these decks. So this is really about how we're all going to learn. Everything. So, yes, asking the big question. So this is a quote that we've got from the book is that, yeah, the general assumption is that tidying doesn't need to be taught, but rather it's picked up naturally. But actually, that's that's completely false. Like everyone needs to learn. We all need to learn everything. Basically, there's no you know innate knowledge that anyone's going to get. So now is the time to learn. I guess if you're here, we're all learning together, which is nice. Um, so. I think the first things first when we are creating a deck is like before you start, you really, really need to visualize your destination. So when uh, Marie is talking about this in the book, she sort of talks about like when you visualize a room, like what do you see and how are you going to get there and what sort of clutter needs to go? And I think the same is true of decks. Like before you start, you really need to visualize actually where am I going with this and what sort of point am I trying to get across to the person that is going to see this, you know, whether that's, you know, asking for more budget or displaying performance results or whatever that is, you really need to visualize what it is that you're starting with and how you're actually going to get there. And I think you really need to focus on the story that you want to tell. So everything's about storytelling with like decks, whether, you know, it doesn't matter what you're trying to get across. It really is about storytelling and all stories can be divided into like three distinct parts. So an opening, then you get your action and then you get a conclusion. So whether that is, you know, if you're going down like, a, let's say a traditional story like Lord of the Rings or something, you'd introduce your protagonist or protagonists. Um, then you show all the actions. So that's all your fight sequences. And then you resolve the conflict at the end, which means you throw the ring into Mordor into Mount Doom, sorry. Um, you know, that's a, like a traditional story, but let's say if you're doing like performance results, uh, or you're, let's say you're trying to get a point across to a client, you're going to disclose what the dilemma is, then you're going to like pull out some sort of pie charts or sort of figures or data or evidence that you've got to back up actually what you need to do. And then at the end, you, you close with your conclusion, your solution and say, this is what I think we should do moving forward. This is how we're going to get there. And the client goes, I love it. That's great. Fantastic. Um, and that's really like focusing on actually how you're going to get to that destination and breaking it into those three clear parts for clients to like understand or whoever that is. I keep saying clients, but you guys know what I mean. 
I think one of the key things about when it comes to decks is trying to condense it. Um, and a lot of us quite often will be like, I only have an hour um, so, and I've got 60 slides here. So I really need to condense them down. And that leads to us feeling like we have to put more than one main idea per slide, which is not a good idea. I think sticking to this rule of one main idea per slide keeps um, information to a, like a digestible level. So you need to really, really make sure that you're only focusing on one thing. The main reason for this is that uh, like a lot of us can only really take in one thing at a time. So if you're stacking multiple ideas on main on, on one slide, you're going to essentially lose some people. Some people are not going to be able to catch up or they're not going to be able to digest all of that information at once. You know, things are going to get dropped and, and that's really where you sort of have that breakdown in communication. So make sure that you're sticking to one main idea per slide. Um, when you're making your deck, this is the classic quote that Maria is sort of known for. It's like, does it spark joy? So sparking joy, when she talks about in the book, is, is about uh, holding up a piece of your clothing or your possessions or belongings and asking yourself this, you know, deep and meaningful question of does it spark joy? And she says that ultimately you will know if something sparks joy the minute you pick it up. You might not be, it's easy to start with clothing uh, and then move on to like mem mementos or like memories, for example. Um, but ultimately you're going to know when you pick something up, whether or not it sparks joy in your life and you're going to know whether or not you need to get rid of it. So yeah, so she says that the best way to do this uh, is to, to pick it up in your hand and ask yourself, does this spark joy? And I think the same is really, really true of like decks, for example. I think every single day, all of us can look at stuff and think about whether or not this, this slide is sparking joy for us. And if it doesn't spark joy in us, there's a strong chance it's not gonna spark joy in, in whoever else is reading it. If, it. if you think it looks bad, then you know that doesn't really show the like care and attention that you probably want to get across to whoever you're presenting to. So one example of things that spark joy is like, this is something that I uh, started doing for Virgin Trains like, like two years ago or whenever it was now. But sparking joy can be really, really simple. It doesn't have to be like some big, great thing. This is an example of like a mock-up that we did, which is just really simple for like an Instagram ad for Virgin um, back in the day before they became Avanti. Uh, and that to me sparks joy, like having that really simple, uh, clear mock-up that they can then get, uh, you know, sort of read into and they can understand the point that coming across that for me sparks joy and showing them showing them the creativity that sort of sparks joy but sparking joy doesn't always necessarily have to just be like creative and I think that's what everyone thinks of when they think of decks is they think of these like big creative things but that's not always the case you can use something as small as like stats you know but that sort of sparks joy to me as well looking at something like this I think it's very clear what we're trying to portray to the client having this idea of one idea per slide one main idea per slide this to me encapsulates that it's very simple it's very classic you know the mock-up is right there for the client to see and then you know you've got your stats right there as well you can quite instantly see how this is going to spark joy not only in me but also to a client when i'm presenting this back to them this is something else that we did for uh, timberland when we were doing their 45th anniversary of their iconic yellow boot we did like a mood board and again this is something else that sparks joy in a completely different way in that the previous example was quite simple and quite classic whereas this is a lot more chaotic and very busy but it still sparks joy for me in that we've used a lot of moving images we've overlaid stuff it, it resembles a mood board you know we've used a uh, quite combination of like color palettes for example there this is another example of something that still sparks joy for me in a completely contrasting way and I feel like because it sparks joy for me the client is then going to buy into that and they're going to also feel that they're you know joyful when you know this as well but it's important to pick your own joy really and sort of look at ways that you can incorporate joy into everything that you do so this is the cover from one of the band's content audits that we did like maybe two or three years ago um, where you know doing a content audit and reading through like lots of stats and like a lot of detail and a lot of text is like can be quite boring but you really need to think of ways that you can bring joy into your own work here because this this slide to me this cover slide like that does bring joy in although it is quite simple again quite simplistic it still is sparking joy for me in that I, you know, I've infused what is going to be a long and lengthy document um, with something that actually is very important to me. And, you know, having that, that sense of like fun and enjoyment when you first open it and look at it, I think is going to put the client in a good mood to receive the rest of that information as well. So uh, the next thing that she says is aim for perfection. This is like a, a good thing to sort of, we can all embody this a little bit. Um, really like aiming for perfection in everything that you do. So when you're tidying, for example, you shouldn't be happy with just like, oh, that'll do. Like, that's not really a good enough excuse. And this is something that I tell my team every day, much to their dismay, uh, when I look at their decks that are not like completely perfectly aligned. But I think 
aiming for perfection is not about being a complete perfectionist. It's about showing whoever you're presenting back to that you have taken the time and the care and attention and detail to make this deck right and to make it look good and to make it perfect essentially you're showing them that you have spent the time there to to really care about them and their business is essentially what you're saying by showing them a perfected piece of work so for the love of god please use the arrange function um by the way throughout this deck there's some examples of like google slides but powerpoint has the same like if not similar sort of functions the arrange function for me in Google Slides is like one of the most underrated and underused functions in there. So I think looking at things like distributing, aligning, you know, making sure that you take the time to use these to even out, you know, space, you know, text boxes or images or whatever that is. I think it's really, really vital and shows clients that actually you do really, really care about the work that you're putting across. So for me, this, this for me is unacceptable. And if some, a member of my team showed me something that looked like this, I would be deeply unhappy with them. I'm, I'm not going to lie to you because you can see that all of the... Um, all of the metrics, the key metrics at the top are out of line. All of the yellow bars are out of line. They're not evenly spaced. And I think that actually just shows the client that you just don't care. You've basically rushed this and you just don't care. And I would completely send that back. Also clients, if you are, if you're hopefully out there, uh, if someone sends you this, then you should be asking, you know, do, do they have they spent the right amount of time on this? You know, are they, are they, do they care about what we, what we putting out there? You know, and um, whereas actually this is much more acceptable in that everything is aligned, everything is centered, it's all spaced evenly, and it literally takes two seconds to align everything. You just select everything in one big box, you click align, uh, you click arrange, and then align in the middle, and everything is just arranged automatically. And it's literally a two second job to just show clients that actually you do care about what they what you the information that you're putting across, and you care about their business. So uh, I think one of the other key things to remember, really, this is like a small section from this same chapter is about your possessions want to help you. So you should be looking at everything that you're giving across and saying that this wants to help you. So if, when Marie talks about in the book, she's talking about how, you know, if, if you if you've got a coat, the coat really wants to protect you from the warmth and the rain, like it wants to help you, which sounds like crazy, but it, it is kind of true in a way. And it's the same is true of, of making these slides. You need to think about actually the things that you're, you're working with, they're actually there to help you and they're there to help you do a good job. You know, there's a reason that, you know, PowerPoint and Google, they'll spend like millions and millions of pounds on these products because they want to enable you to do the best job that you possibly can. And that's, that's really there to help you. So I think things like this, again, make my skin like absolutely crawl. Uh, so like immediately I can see on the left, like the font choices just completely out of line with what's in the, in the heading and then use the use of those like stock photo images, just horrible, just absolutely horrible. I just hate them every time I see them. So things like that, I think, you know, you, 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 you want to portray like creativity and and care and passion about what you're doing. I think, you know, small touches like that, again, they really, really help you. And, and this whole, you know, thing about aiming for perfection is really, really important. So this is actually much, much better in that we can see like the stats and everything in that line. They're more in keeping with the other stats that we've seen throughout this deck. The font choices are the same. And then also on the right as well, not everything has to be lit so literal when we're doing um, decks. Like I find that a lot of the time, this is probably not just specific to marketing, but a lot of the time people will feel like they have to immediately show like, like in the example, it was like SEO. So we need to show like a picture of SEO, which is like, it's an abstract concept. You know what I mean? How are we going to portray this? Whereas actually if we show a tree, we're showing organic growth. What is organic growth? That is SEO. It's the same thing. So not everything has to be so literal. And like I use pictures of like keys or superheroes, or I once used a, a picture of Chris Hemsworth. Uh, no, Chris Evans from Captain America in a client deck that went over to the North Face and they loved it. But it's that sort of thing, that sort of, you know, thinking outside the box and showing again, this creativity and this care and attention to clients that is really, really beneficial. And then the last thing on this is please, please high quality images. You don't know, it's a lot, it, a lot of us fall into this trap quite easily of, um, when you're looking at something on like a laptop screen, you uh, you just pick an image and it looks fine on a laptop screen, but you don't always know where this is going to be presented, especially if you're going to do an actual physical presentation. Like the board, sometimes we, uh, like the, the big uh, screen in the crowd, like main boardroom is like enormous. So quite a lot of the time we see images like blown up onto there that are like six pixels and they look like they've been taken on a potato, which is not great. And it's not the same image that you, you know, it's not what you want if you're going out to a client meeting, you're not, you don't want to, um, 
you don't want that to happen. You want to show again this care and this perfection and level of detail. So high quality images, all it takes is again two seconds in Google when you're looking for an image, just settings, uh, and then I think it's like large image, and then you're away. So um, next we're going to talk about uh, underestimating the noise of written information and this talks more a little bit more about like design principles that you can apply to decks. So when Marie talks about this in the book she talks about um, how we are constantly bombarded with the noise of written information and what she means is like everywhere we look there's always like text. Like think about if you're getting on like the tube for example you're going to see ads everywhere that are just text, text, text. The same if we're like at home as well like you know you go into the shower and there's text all over your like shampoos and your show and your soaps and shower gels and you know all these things all your cleaning products for example you all text everywhere and actually it can be quite overwhelming um, and it's the same really with decks as well you, it's easy for us to underestimate the noise of this written information when we're portraying something back to the client not everything needs to be written down it doesn't always need to be like pure text all the time or always and I think I've got that. so um one of the examples and one of the design principles that I really want to talk about here is like cognitive overload and cognitive overload. Like there's a description on the, the right hand side there, um, which you can read later if you so wish. But basically the principle is cognitive overload is where you present so much information to someone that they just their brain just goes like, nah, and just stops working. So I don't know if you've ever been to like a restaurant where the menu is like board sheet like seven pages and you literally just sit there and you're like, what the actual hell is going on? Like. I don't know how much where to even start with this. The same is true of clients. If you're presenting, you know, a slide that has all of this information, they're just not, they just completely will zone out or they won't, you know, where nowhere to look, or alternatively, they'll stop listening to you while they try and figure it out. You know, you need to be really, really be aware of that when you're presenting stuff back to clients. So a good example of this, and it's not really gonna work over Zoom, unfortunately, but when I did this um, in real life, I basically had people shout out the right answers. But basically what I wanna show here is like, then we've got all these campaign names, right? And we've got like all the different metrics that are associated with it, but which ones of these have performed the best against which metrics? Like it's, it's really, really difficult for us, to, for clients and for us as well to instantly understand which of those has done really, really well, you know, like we've got to scan down each row and then look at the associated label and think, oh, right. So for signups, it's, uh, is it butter or is it peanut butter? I, I don't really know. And then for like, if we're looking at like the different changes in CPA, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then we've got extra columns in there that are not really needed, like resolution. Do we really need to know that? Probably not. But this is the kind of thing that I see quite a lot in tables, both in, you know, like in either internally or previous agencies or alternatively coming from other suppliers. I think this is the kind of stuff that we need to filter out and, and really think about actually how we're presenting this. Um, so what I did was sort of strip all of that away and basically say, this is what you need to look at. If we're measuring it against each of the three different metrics that were in the, the three different columns, we can instantly see you know, for signups, the best was peanut butter, the lowest CPA was jelly, and then the highest um, bread toppings was the banana campaign. Like, it's very simple, it's easily laid out. We can all digest that in seconds, and then we can get back to talking to whoever is presenting or whoever is talking, um, and really like understanding what they have to say and actually focusing really clearly on that. And then the same sort of goes for text as well. So I, this is an example of like a slide that I saw someone present once, and I just thought, this is way too much text, like way, way too much text. Like, if you've got all of that, clients are going to sit there and try and read the whole thing while you're talking so they either miss you or they misunderstand things or it just takes a long time and, and it's not really what's needed if you feel like you need this much text you should probably be sending it in an email to be honest um, you don't need to sit in in a meeting with a client who's had to travel or you've had to travel and, and read all of this off to them it's just not necessary um, the other thing as well is with, with text, just these design principles, um, large blocks of text, please, please left align them. Um, left aligned text has like a straight edge, whereas if you choose something else like center text, it's got like a differently shaped edge. Called, here it's called like a ragged left edge. And basically the point of it is, is in the human brain, it's much easier for us if we know where the start of the sentence is, like visually on a page, we know where to instantly draw our eyes back to and it makes reading a lot quicker and a lot easier. Whereas if you have like a ragged like cut edge, then you have to constantly, every time you read down on a new line, you have to work out where you're starting from again and then you have to then be like oh and then you connect the two and then you start reading again which seems like 
when you're actually doing it, it's not much of a difference, but actually in terms of comprehending the information, it really is. And also when you're in a client you know, meeting or, or whatever that is, if you've only got 60 minutes, you want to make every second count. So you want to make things as easy and as digestible as possible. So really, really make sure that you are left lining large blocks of text. Large blocks of text is like basically anything over three lines. Um, and then the same also applies to um, web design, please everyone. Um, what you should do is basically reduce until something clicks. So uh, and when Marie talks about this in the book, she talks about throwing things away until finally you're like, aha, and you have this like eureka moment of like, oh, of course, this is what my life could be like this whole time. Um, and then the same is true of like decks as well. Like just reduce until something clicks. Um, and just take away some of those slides, those unnecessary slides that ultimately you could probably talk around. Like, I'm sure, like, I consider myself an expert in my field and I consider everyone that I work with to be experts in their field as well. And when I was giving this talk to them, I said, you know, you sh we should all be able to talk around the slides that we're presenting. And I'm sure we all can. Like, we don't need these reams of text there, for example, to, to talk about something when we could just have that open, honest dialogue with a client or with whoever to talk about actually, you know, what's, what we're presenting. So the main point of this is to sort of reduce down the number of slides that we're presenting. So when you consider that uh, it takes about 1.5 to three minutes per slide, that's sort of how you want to pace um, the number of slides that you've got until um, to maximize the amount of time that you've got. So say if you've got like a two hour meeting, you, you'd sort of um, pad it out so that you know that you're going to hit roughly that two hours and not really go over. Nothing worse I find than like going over on a client meeting. Um, but you want to stick to this sort of time frame and really reducing down these slides, especially these excess slides, is the way to do that and to make sure that you're actually going to go and, and hit the right amount of time that you're taking for like client meetings. Just an example of this is, so this is again a slide that I presented, I think, to Timberland, where we were talking about, um, you know, the the 45th um, Yellow Boot um, anniversary, which was like maybe two years ago, um, and we we were showing them these, some like mock-ups of like press coverage that we were hoping to get from the Huddersfield Daily Examiner, which is really the highlight I find of regional news. Um, but we were showing them this example, and we were talking to them about the approach, right? And we're talking to them and, um, and that's all fine. But a lot of people will say, well, that's fine in the voiceover of the meeting, but what about if they share this deck afterwards? And I hear that. So um, we were comfortable, like I was comfortable to talk over this in the meeting, but then in the actual deck, I included this slide where it talks about all of our different approaches to the various different publications, so eco-friendly, regional, fashion, national, all those sorts of things, and talking about actually how we could, you know, approach them and some examples that we would do. But including this, but just skipping it, just like in um, Google Slides again, and there's probably the same in, in PowerPoint, there is a feature to skip slides. So I just included that and then just skipped it. So in, this, in the run-through with the client, it's gone. But then when they export or when we send it as a PDF or when they share it, all the information that they need is there and it's really, really good. The other thing that's really good as well is like, it, this works quite a lot for people who need that bit of text written out, even just to organize their own thoughts. Because like, I'm quite visual and it works for me to easily be like, there's an image of an apple and I'm just going to talk around it for 45 minutes. Whereas a lot of people do need that, you know, written out um, blocks of text for their own thoughts, which I think is fine. But what you should do is then just split those over two slides, skip one that's got all the text on, keep it so that the client can understand what's the con what the context of the previous slide is, but then just on the previous one, just have that, you know, that one image or whatever that they need. Um, the other thing that's really important here from like a design point of view is about negative space. And negative space is a really, really powerful tool. Um, you know, I'm sure that we've all seen, you know, it was like TED Talks or uh, whatever, or big talks at like Brighton SEO or something, uh, where they just have like, bam, like one word, and then that's it, where it just says, imagine. Um, and the reason for that is that they, they, they stick into that one, one idea per, per slide um, rule that we talked about before, but also negative space is a really, really powerful tool. We shouldn't be afraid of it. Like, if you have like a slide like this, you know, it's really clear, hopefully you'll all remember this now, um, that negative space is a powerful tool, but also there's no need to then fill in all this white space around it. That, that's absolutely fine. You can just leave it. You don't have to put images. You don't have to resize the text to be 120 point. Like it doesn't matter. Creating that negative space creates drama and it creates like a stronger visual impact that ultimately the people that you're presenting to are, are more likely to, to remember and to recognize. So another thing, just in the spirit of reducing down until it clicks, Marie says you should keep things because you love them, not just because. 
So again, coming back to this point of um, we're all experts in what we're talking about, we should be able to talk around everything, right? So quite a lot of the time I'll hear, oh, well, I want to keep that slide, you know, just in case like a client asks for it or, you know, those, the, that table of stats, actually, they've really, really, they've requested that. Um, but actually, you can do without all of that. Um, you really, really can. Like, you, you know, these are, when you get into this habit of like reducing things down, you, it becomes really, really obvious and really clear. And actually, I think makes you a better presenter ultimately in the long run because you can just think on your feet and you can, you know, learning that you can do without all of those things. Um, if you are finding that, you know, you absolutely have to keep something for some reason, I think that there are those exceptions and there are those some cases and some people also haven't I don't know been to a lovely lecture about uh, how to create beautiful slides so they won't understand where you're coming from and if that if you encounter that then there's always oh the appendix the appendix is great you know if you do need to have those big tables of stats you can just chuck everything in there the client probably will read it in the end if they're interested if they're not interested then you didn't need it in the deck in the first place if they are interested then they'll read it it's a catch-22 and then you've got them there um but i think ultimately all of this is really about um being surrounded by things that uh, bring joy and make you happy like tables of stats like that they don't bring me joy at all and they don't make me happy uh, I think I find them quite overwhelming, quite confusing. I think a lot of people do and we're just a little bit too afraid to admit it. But the other thing as well is sometimes going into work can be quite, you know, monotonous and like, I love my job. I think it's great. Uh, like I love working a crowd, but you know, it is still work. And I think that a lot of the time you need to surround yourself with things that you enjoy and stuff that makes you happy. And if making slides or making decks in a, in a particular way that you enjoy makes you happy, then I think that that is something that you should really bring to your job every day. Because the happier you are at work, the happier that people around you are going to be, the happier that your clients are going to be, they're going to see that you're happy and that you enjoy the work that you do. So bringing that energy and bringing, you know, that sort of care and attention to all of the work that you do, I think is really important. And the same should be true of all of the decks that you create as well. So just taking that time to be like, you know, perfectionist and uh, attentive um, and thoughtful about the work that you're doing, I think is ultimately what's really, really key here. And I think that's it. Um, I don't know if anyone has any like Q&A questions that I can answer, yes. Um, do you think there's sometimes a case of having two versions of a deck, one presenting? Yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I don't know if you guys can see this, but I'm just gonna read it out just in case. But it says, do you think there's sometimes a case for having two versions of a deck? So one for presenting and one for sharing. I think absolutely. So if you're not going down that sort of route of, um, that route of having skipped slides, I think definitely you can add like text on. I know it's so, so to a lot of people, this will seem like uh, like a slight overkill or we seem like too much, you know, um, to do that. I think absolutely, especially if it's like a really big, you know, meeting, if it's like a pitch or, you know, you're presenting it like Brighton SEO. I don't know why that's what, the one that's on my mind, but that, you know, in that instance, I think for sure, giving that little bit of context, especially if you do have one or two images, I think is definitely key. Um, I don't know if anyone else has any other questions. Um, if not, you can always email me. My email is on the slide right there. Um, and that's sort of it really. Um, yeah, so lovely. Thank you all for coming, I guess. If anyone was even there in the first place, I hope you were. Um, but if not, um, I'll look out for your emails. All right, thanks everyone. <laughs>